welcome everyone. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm Suzanne Kinawi, marketing manager for Egypt Europe uh, for the American University in Cairo Press and Hoop of Fiction. And thank you so much for joining us today for our virtual book discussion of the night we'll have at say, a novel by Ibrahim al Um And today's event is gonna be around an hour and we are gonna have a room for some Q&A at the end. So please, if you have any questions, type them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, or if you're joining from Facebook Live, please type the question in the comment section and we're gonna ask them for you. Okay, today's novel, The Night Will Have It Say, is a retelling of the Muslim wars of conquest in the North Africa during the Middle Ages, narrated from the perspective of the conquered peoples. It's written in Ibrahim Kony's unique and enchanting voice. His lyrical and deeply poetic prose speaks to themes that are intensely timely. Uh, through the wars and conflicts of this distant, turbulent era, he addresses the futility of war, the privilege of an elite few at the expense of the many, and the destruction of natural habitats and indigenous cultures and questions about literal and fundamentalist interpretations of religious texts. If you haven't uh, read the novel yet, you can purchase your copy through major books retailers worldwide, and I'll be posting a couple of purchase links in the chat box for your ease. About our author, Ibrahim al Kouni, he was born in the northwest of the Sahara Desert in Libya in 1948, and he learned uh, to read and write Arabic at the age of 12. He has been hailed a magical realist, a Sufi fabulist, and a poetic novelist. And his more than 80 books contain mythological elements, spiritual quests, and existential questions. His books have been translated into 35 languages and include uh, Gold Dust, and The New Oasis, both published by AUC Press, The Animus, and The Puppet, and many more. And among the many literary prizes that, to his name, he has been awarded the Sheikh Zayed Prize for Literature, and he was shortlisted for the International Booker Prize. In today's book discussion, we're honored to have with us Nancy Roberts, the translator of The Night Will Have Its Say. She's an award-winning translator of a number of Arabic novels, including The Man from Bashmore, for which she received a commendation for uh, in the Save Ghubash Benipal Prize for Translation, and Ibrahim Nasrallah's Time of White Horses and The Lanterns of the King of Galilee and the Gaza Weddings, for which she was awarding uh, the 2018 Sheikh Hamad Prize for Translation and International Understanding. Welcome, Nancy. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Also, uh, in our discussion, uh, would be moderated by Emily Drumster. Thank you so much for joining and helping us. Uh, who is the assistant professor for um, Middle Eastern Studies and French and Italian Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. And she's specialized in modern and Arabic, uh, modern Arabic and Francophone uh, literatures. Please join me in uh, welcoming our panelists. And now over to you, Emily. Thank you so much, Suzanne. And thank you, Nancy. And welcome to everyone who's, who's joining us from from all over the world, um, it's it's really a great opportunity to um, to have a conversation about this really incredible novel. Um, so yeah, Nancy and I will just do a few questions back and forth to sort of get some information out there and dig into the novel itself just a tiny bit, and then um, we'll open it up to to uh, to questions from from the audience. So um, hi, Nancy. <laughs> Um, so we got a little, thanks to Suzanne for that micro uh, biography of Ibrahim al Kouni, but I'm wondering if you can tell us, um, and uh, you know, we also got a brief introduction to his reputation in Arabic literature, which is, you know, as a Libyan author, maybe the best known Libyan author, I would say, um, very different from a lot of familiar faces from Egypt, Lebanon, Palestine. So, um, can you tell us more about how does the night will have it say fit into Alconi's oeuvre, like his, we heard 91 volumes, right? Where is this book? Okay. Well, um, I've been thinking, yeah, I, I 
been thinking about that question. And um, so there are a number of ways in which it contrasts with his uh, earlier works and a number of ways in which it, it's, uh, it has a lot of common themes. So for, 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 to my knowledge, and I could be wrong about this, but I believe it's one of his only historical novels. Um, and so in that way, it departs significantly uh, from a lot of his stuff, which is based in historical places and, and so forth, but not, it doesn't focus on a specific historical era or historical figures. Um, another thing that I believe sets it apart somewhat from his other works is his focus on the centrality and the dignity of women. Um, that comes through very clearly from the day of page one to almost to the end. And uh, this is tied in turn to the relationship between Islam on one hand and the native religions of North Africa on the other, uh, which are colliding in this book in a, a very dramatic way. So um, I can say a little bit more about that later, about what it, the, the ways in which the novel brings out the importance of women and how it was focused on in these early religions. Um, but another uh, way in which it, I think it contrasts with other work, works is his focus, again, on the, the concept of, or the, the theme of religion. There is a, what he calls a lost scripture. He calls it on, and uh, the scripture no longer lists, exists in written form, but it's um, <clears throat> in the hearts of the people. The, the concepts, the precepts are still there in people's hearts. Um, and according to the narrator, and um, I believe you're going to, um, this ancient scripture contains the basic fundamental truths that are common to all the religions. Um, and that if the Muslim invaders had understood this, they would have approached things much more differently than, than they did. Mm -hmm. um, so then we have the futility of, of course, we, you know, we, we, I have what I want to say, clinging to the, the um, the literal meaning of scriptures, which uh, he, I think, is an accusation that he directs against the Muslim uh, conquerors as well. They were looking at the letter, not at the spirit. And so since your religion doesn't have the name Islam, therefore it does not reflect the truth. And we are bound by God to uh, bring you into the fold. And then um, he talks about the failure, not, not directly, but more or less, he talks about the failure of every religion that ever come to establish justice on earth. Um, so, oh, and the, the other the other theme that I saw as being more or less uh, unique to this novel is the sacredness and the power of language itself. And um, the theme of language comes up again and again from the very first um, scene, as you'll know. And uh, so, as uh, you mentioned in your written question. Uh, we're talking about translation here, and the very first scene is a, an encounter between the Berber queen of Kahina and um, of an envoy that's been sent by Narman, um, Ibn, Hassan Ibn Narman, the Muslim commander. And uh, the interpreter is very busy trying to convey the message of each one to the other, and uh, uh, there's a bit of comic comedy in that first See, at least I, I felt that there was. The poor guy is really working very hard at his best. Um, so those are things that I think uh, are, are unique to this novel, or at least to some extent. And then we also we have a lot of common themes. So one obvious one is the mystery, the majesty, and the sacredness of the desert. The desert always is the you know the, the backdrop to almost all of Tony's novels. And um, <clears throat> We have human hubris, uh, the pride of humanity, our tendency not to recognize our limits. Uh, we cling to an illusion of permanence that is uh, destructive to us because it, um, we want to impose permanence where it doesn't exist. Um, and we destroy our environment in the process of trying to make ourselves limitless. So this comes out in the novel as it does in a lot of his other works. Um, there's a tension between settled and nomadic life, the, the life of the city versus the life of the desert. And um, this again is related to the, our attempt to create permanence where it doesn't exist. 
And uh, Italiana herself was quite, quite um, vehement about this. In fact, you might call her extremist because she is so determined to um, cause her people not to depend on the, the stability of the city that she actually raises a city to the ground practically and forces the people out into the desert, um, which doesn't do much for her popularity, I think. Um, then we have the, the theme of day and night, which is, comes out in the title of the book. Um, and of course, day and night are kind of related to justice versus injustice, evil and good. And um, there's a quote in the very beginning of the book. He quotes the Ibn Atahia, who was a seventh century poet. Um, it says, never has day given way to night, nor the stars orbited the heavens, but to transfer power from a ruler whose reign has given way to another. So it's like a cycle. Um, the cycle of power and clinging to power goes on and on and on. Um, then um, we have also the, the theme of native cultures, native languages, native religions, and their place. Um, and um, their, their sacredness is, of course, connected to the sacredness of the land um, in general. At least, I mean, every even Christianity and Islam, um, they, they hold land sacred, but not quite in the way that the more native, like, uh, the, the more earth-centered uh, religions do, in the sense that they may think of land, this land is holy, but that land is not. Whereas uh, the more indigenous relig uh, religions tend to think of land period as holy, and therefore, all that life is sacred, no matter where you find it. Um, let's see. There's Actually, wanna, can I just jump in real, real quickly to ask? <clears throat> um, so that that moment where the Kahina, um, you know, order. So first of all, just for the audience, um, for those not familiar with um, Al Kahina. Um, this is a figure who's so important in um, the, in Maghrebi cultural production, North African cultural production, as um, a, obviously a female um, hero, but also as a soothsayer and as a an indigenous resistor of the Muslim conquests and the Arab conquests from the East, who actually succeeded. Um, and you know, she has many many lives. <laughs> First, uh, you know, among in uh, among people in the Maghreb, but then also, you know, she gets uh, heroized by the French um, during French and then probably in, in Libya, I imagine by, because her, her main domain was the Ores Mountains in, in Algeria. So she gets heroized by French Orientalist discourse as, you know, um, the opposite of being Arab, right? So an, an, a resistor to the Arabs who has a sort of connection to the French as the new colonizers. Um, but it's just so do you so my question is, do you happen to know, um, because like you said that a lot of the themes in this novel are common to uh, other novels by Alconi, one of which I mean to me the biggest thing about Alconi's work is this valuation of the desert and nomadism um, mm -hmm. and the harshness of the desert as something. Uh, over settled life. And the novel that I know the best because I teach it is Gold Dust, which oh. is really about that tension, you know, where he gets too comfortable in the oases and then going back out into the desert makes him whole in a certain way, but it also causes him to neglect. Other... Anyway, it's this always this tension between settled life and nomadic life. Um, do you know <clears throat> if he, Akuni, did historical research on the on Al Kahina and um, in the novel she's called the oh, I'm sure he yes did. oh yeah yeah um, he doesn't refer to these sources but uh, I'm sure he did a lot of research yeah yeah of course there are, there are different there are different narratives you know not all their narratives about her agree right like, like any historical hero, mythology gets mixed in with reality and, and you can't be totally sure where the facts begin and end um so but yes most definitely um i'll never ask him directly but uh 
he, he, he lists or he refers indirectly to various and sundry sources. Um, so. Yeah. So he definitely was 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 reading, oh, he's was a, researching. You know, it's yeah. Knowledgeable history. He's like an encyclopedia. Uh, so yeah. Without That's great. Exactly what books he was referring to. Uh, he, he does every now and then. He will refer actually to um, a historical book, even in the in the novel. He does every now and then. Um, and I can't remember right now which ones those were, but I remember it happening. Um, that's yeah, I remember it happening too. Yeah, and just the fact of so many figures who are central to early Islamic history are characters in this book. Um, mm -hmm. And your, by the way, your the 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 um, what is it called at the end? The sort of guide that you give to the reader, um, the key terms and and people and historical figures is really helpful. So, folks, if you're intimidated by historical fiction, don't be because Nancy's guide sort of situates you in the early Islamic history where you need to be to, to understand what's going on in this novel. Um, I have to refer to it back to it. <laughs> me too, me too, I really do. That's not my not my field. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and who, who lived when and who came before the other and so forth. So, yeah, um, I find yeah. it So, okay, we've already gotten into the novel itself, so let's just get right into the novel. Um, so, um, let's talk more about historical fiction. <laughs> so it, it, this novel, on the one hand, it definitely, I mean, just baseline is historical fiction because it's about an actual period of history featuring actual historical characters. But at the same time, it melds that genre of fiction with Alcone's signature dreamlike and almost surreal inner monologues of this female, strong female character um, mm. of the Kahin of whom he calls uh, Dahiya, which is, uh, I think, more her, her proper name. She has well, a few I, different names. Yeah, it, it's confusing. It, it has taken many forms. Dahiya, Dahiya. It's not really yeah. sure because, of course, Dahiya means a, a cunning, a cunning figure. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not sure. She has a many names in the novel, by the way. Um, Lioness, Tibhi, yes. um, and so the forth. priestess or the, yeah. The soothsayer, uh, the queen, in a, a couple of times, I think you may read, even refer her to, to her as a queen. Yeah. So yeah, so, so just tell us more about the translation process and, and, you know, what it was like to work on the one hand with, you know, the historical figures from, from early Islam and mm -hmm. on the other hand with, this imagined inner life, um, poetic, you know, alternative religion in the mind of um, Dehya. <laughs> well, let's see. Where shall I start? Um, first of all, you had uh, in, in like in your written question, you'd talk to me or you'd ask me about the various kind of genres that I could see in in the novel. I might start there. Um, of course, there's historical narrative, or at least semi semi historical narrative just the narration of facts and then we have there's a kind of prophetic there's a prophetic sense about the book he starts out the book with a quote from the oracles of delphi um which speaks about the land of olivia which is in a quite dramatic way and um it reminds me of the the, the old testament prophets um woe be to you and beware of their actions, they will have consequences and so forth. Um, so, and I think that, I think that Oconi kind of thinks of himself as a kind of prophet in that sense, you know, not in the sense of predicting future things, but, but of warning, the warner. Um, and so that, that, that genre was clearly in, in my mind as I was reading this thing. Um, this goes along with it, moral critique, a lot of moral critique. Um, the narrator does not pretend to be uh, neutral. Um, <clears throat> and he's, he definitely critiques the different characters and the events and so forth, the injustice of uh, the Umayyads and um, <clears throat> their greed and uh, the corruption of the religion through their greed, their, their, their motives, the, the spoils that, uh, the soldiers just to come out to fight 
for material reasons. Um, and then and then we have not much actual poetry, but we have the, the poet who has a couple of at least two um, chapters devoted to him. And I thought these were really beautiful. Um, this, this poet uh, has a very important function in the society, especially during wartime. He goes out to the field. He has his lyre in his hand. He's singing. Um, he's singing ballads of glories past. He's paying tribute to fallen heroes. He's reminding the warriors of the women folk who await them back home, um, trying to reinvigorate them. And, um, uh, and then also, it, we were told that he was appointed as a Kahn as um, kind of his, 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 her herald. So when she mm -hmm. had, used to tell the people, he, he would go out. And for all we know, he, he did it in, in verse, um, which, which would make it even more um, interesting. Now, I, I, I quoted, I just want, I just wrote down a quote that I thought was particularly nice when it came yeah. to the poet's role. Uh, it's on page 65. And the narrator says, as the peoples of the world discovered long ago, every glory is destined for oblivion unless the poet rushing to the rescue immortalizes it in verse. I just thought it's, it's just a beautiful uh, description of the, the role of the poet and how important he was uh, or he was back in those days. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you had also asked me like what I found um, challenging about the mingling of genres. Of course, for me, I, I love the mingling of genres. I, I don't find it, uh, I think, it's a wonderful thing. And um, so I don't have, it doesn't pose a difficulty so much as um, the most difficult thing, I think, is the density of Coney's prose itself. His mm -hmm. prose is just so packed. It's so eloquent. The sentences are long, they're convoluted. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I forget where I had to go back and read the end, you know, go back to the beginning of the sentence to start all over again. Like, I'm where's the Moptada? You know, parenthetical phrases and so forth. Um, so that, that alone is just difficult. I'd just be exhausted by the end of a sentence just trying to. First of all, let's just get the basic content of the sentence into English. Very, very, mm -hmm. very bad English. Okay. And then mm -hmm. you go back and you start to see, okay, what was he saying? And then how do I say it in a way that is as eloquent as his and in a way that's not, doesn't have such long sentences, that reads nicely, um, that reads as easily as possible. So that was just a constant, uh, pretty much a constant. Uh, challenge. And um, just to say, I want to hear the next thing that you have to say so much. Just to say that, like, that's a, it's the, that's like a constant Arabic translator of prose challenge is oh, yes. the yes. longer the sentence, the more eloquent in Arabic, whereas English really wants clear, compact um, sentences. And, but Al Koni, I would say, I mean, my experience of reading him stretches that already existing issue, mm -hmm. like, question of eloquence between the two languages to its absolute limit. And when you're in this other world, not only in time, but in space of this novel, there's just so many challenges and factors. So I really admire, I mean, this translation is eminently readable, but not in a way that I think sacrifices any of the otherworldliness of the of the Arabic. So just like kudos from, from <laughs> my point of view on that on that front. Yeah. Yeah. And also, I, I had a difficult time with um, scenery, scenery descriptions. I find, yeah, dialogue and descriptions of people much more easy. And I'm just easier. I'm just trying to imagine what he's, I'm trying to picture in my mind. And I even have difficulty doing that. I, even in English, I'm not, sometimes I pass over passages like that in an English novel. Well, never mind, just, just tell me what happened. I, I just want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to the next dialogue. Mm -hmm. So that was that was difficult. But his his um, descriptions of the natural world and the rolling hills and the thunder and the, and the 
you know, the wind, I rem during the, the season when I sat here and I was talking to the, um, the um, envoy, every now and then, you know, the thunder will rumble or the, the, whistle, the wind will blow. And the, yeah. The wind I mean, like she's rustle. in the, she's like an embodiment of everything is so linked with each other throughout yeah. the novel. Like he, it's part of the manifestation of the human is not separate from the natural like she is like the so yeah like the thunder punctuates her speech it's because she like the, the, the chorus the, the chorus yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> emphasizing what she's saying so um that was fun i mean it was exciting when you know we can get it to when you feel it you've conveyed uh the scene um uh, let me see there were things of course that i simply didn't understand and so I wrote to him a lot. There was a constant back and forth um, between us throughout the entire translation process. And he was great. So lucky to be able to do that. Just to say also, uh -huh. like, to work uh -huh. on a living writer is really, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I mean, I've, I've rarely found a trans, uh, um, an author who doesn't like that. They, they, they appreciate it. I remember Ibrahim Nasrallah once said, there's nothing more frightening than a translator who doesn't ask me any questions. And I, I see what he's saying, because honestly, how can you not ask? There's so mm -hmm. many. And it's, when you, it's a one thing to read a novel. You, OK, you get the story. But when you're translating, you are responsible for figuring out the role of that word in that sentence and what exactly would the connection between this and that and so it becomes you read a text in a very different not a different way but you have to really pay attention yeah I'm, a lot of translation theory says that you no know that you didn't understand this yeah <laughs> so yeah. um and then there oh th this is something i've never encountered before uh, there were passages where he would be describing a cat his thoughts and, and there might even be a conversation between her, I think it's in her grandfather. And he's just describing what she said to him and what he said to her and what she said to him and what he said to her. And it's all in the third person and very abstract. I thought, I can't, this, this isn't working at all. So I converted it into a dialogue. I just converted the third person into you know second person and created the dialogue, which I was very happy with the result. Um, I'd never encountered that encounter and um, that challenge before because most of the time you don't need to do that. But that was kind of a unique uh, feature. Yeah. Guess. Um. So those are some things about you know the translation process. That's um, great. I love the glimpse behind the scenes. Always, I really appreciate it. <laughs> no, no. Um, awesome. Yeah. Um, let's go back to something you mentioned earlier, um, and then maybe after this, we'll open it up a little bit to questions. So this is this will be my last formal intervention. Um, so this book also, I mean, I just feel like always Alconi is pushing the limits of Arabic language and Arabic eloquence, and what can this language accommodate from this other landscape and other ancient ways of being and um, so, but the novel more than any that I've read by him incorporates so much uh, Tamazigh language. I hope that's the oh, right yeah. word for the. Yeah, um, I, I say Amazigh, and and I've seen it written and said other ways. So yeah, there may be various ways. Yeah. Yeah. So and and as we mentioned, it features a translator as one of the central characters. Um, so it's partly a novel about translations, about encounters between different languages and how often those are um, mediated by uh, power relationships and often violent power relationships, military might, um, but also by notions of divinity and, and, and non-divinity. So um, just, you know, how did the thematization of translation did you feel like this novel was sort of like reflecting back or raising the stakes of translation to you? And what's your read on just the sheer amount of Tamazight in, in the novel? I mean, is like, 
on the one hand, I want to say he pushes the limits of Arabic. And on the other hand, I'm like, what if he just couldn't he write in in like Arabic is as arbitrary a language as to write in French or you know what I mean? So um, just yeah. tell us about Tamazight and it, it being in here. <laughs> That's a very, very good question. And this was um, a really interesting question to think about. Because um, I was aware from the very start of the novel that it, one of its themes would be language and translation uh, and encounters between languages. Because the very first scene is this encounter between a Kahina who speaks one language and this Arabic envoy, Arab envoy, who speaks only Arabic. And um, so, uh, and I was drawn in immediately. It was uh, his, the way he depicts the interpreter uh, and the language that uh, the canon speaks, not only by transliterating it deliberately, but also by describing it. He'll say, in her melodious tongue, she said, mm -hmm. her, her um, musical gibberish. And he, he draws your attention to the language. It's very deliberate. And he, he didn't have to write all that because immediately after we have the translation into Arabic. Right. So the whole point here, folks, is to focus on the fact that this is a process of translation going on. And it's vital that there's one point where she, she leans in to try to make sure she's understanding because if she doesn't, things could blow up. You know, she, could, she and her people could be wiped out. And so this, there's definitely a power uh, imbalance here. And, uh, and then, um, so I could tell that it was very, very, very deliberate that he Amazigh. And I was fascinated because he had transliterated the Amazigh into Arabic. And now I'm transliterating that into English. And, and of course, as I would note, the, I would compare the Amazigh with the Arabic. And sure enough, yeah, the, that was that's the real language because um, because where you repeated a word in Arabic, there it was. And and I learned a few words in Amazigh that way because mm -hmm. this means look and this means that and this means that. Um, so he wants to bring out the the beauty and the importance of her language. This is a big part of who she was, and um, and who her people were. So um, this, of course, I fell in love with the book through this first scene. I was, that was that. Um, I might mm -hmm. mention that he, I, I met Ibrahim of Kony uh, once, and it was in 2018 at a conference in Doha. In fact, it might be when I was awarded the, the uh, Sheikh Hamad uh, uh, prize. So uh, I, was, I was amazed. I was, here I was getting to meet him. I was, so um, excited, you know, and, and he, to my amazement, he said he wanted me to translate something for him. So he said he was going to give me three novels and he wanted me to choose one. So prolific. <laughs> I just, I'm amazed by him. Yeah, go on. <laughs> he gave me El, El, um, El Waram, the, the tumor, which was long listed, by the way, for the International Prize for Arabic Fiction in 2009. And Men Anta Ayuhal Malat, another one around the same time. Um, okay, so in the order, I think I, I started with the littler ones. What am I read that one? And then I read Men uh, Anta Ayuhal Malat. Okay, all right. So then I went on to the third one, the, lo the longest by far. And I was hooked. That was the one for me. The, the, the centralizing of the woman, the, 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 the language, the translation it, uh, theme, the, the religion theme, these all just spoke directly to me. Um, the, I mean, not only are they, not only are they uh, having this rep repartee or whatever you want to call this exchange about, um, uh, well, in fact, the most of the, this book's exchange is about religion. Mm -hmm. Most right. focuses on religion. Because mm -hmm. the whole reason for being there is that he uh, has a mandate. They have a mandate, they believe, to bring these people into the Islamic religion. And she pushes back, you know, very eloquently. Yeah. So um, 
these these things so so the emphasis on translation in that first scene of course uh plus the power of her her personality and the theme of religion just completely drew me in and i was there was no question in my mind as to which one i wanted to translate yeah and let me see i was going to say something and just, just to let the audience know for i see most of many are arabic speakers but the the title in in arabic is uh al right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so i mean i actually i love your solution i mean your your mm -hmm. you know translation of that um the night will have it say it's like literally that would be something like the the night's word about the rights of the day, you know, but of course that doesn't really make any sense. And as you said, this so much of it is about cycles of um, power and how those don't necessarily map onto increasing levels of justice and day and night as figurations of justice and, and injustice. Um, so, you know, what does the night have to say about the rights of the day? Just that haq, you know, is like, yeah, and fi haq anhar, sometimes that, that word fi haq can mean in the sense of against. Sadr hukum bi haq fulan. And a ruling was issued against, usually it's against so and so. Fi um, haq, so, so that, that expression tends to be against or kind of on a, neg on a, a negative sense. And so it's, a, it's the it's the enmity or it's the, the tension between night and day. And, and um, I felt that saying the night will have it say, and I could, could have said against the day to finish it, but I just I just chopped it off. And as Connie, he noticed that and he said, yes, I like the way you just chopped it off. Don't, don't, don't say the rest. You don't need to. Um, yeah. And, um, so, and interestingly, when you mentioned about the power um, dynamics, it, it, it happens that the interpreter had learned Arabic some years earlier when he fell captive to the invading Muslim army. He had been fighting on the side of Qusayda, who was um, al Kahina's predecessor. He was a Berber king, and he had been fighting against the invaders as well. And so the whole reason he knew Arabic in the first place was that he had been taken captive by Muslim a Muslim army. Um, so, and and you had also asked me a question about um, the translator as a uh, traitor or, or or that. Kind yeah, of thing. yeah, that the the old adage, you know, um, traditore traditore, which is plays on that punning in um, yeah. in. Uh, Italian. <laughs> and so is the translator always a, a traitor, you know? Yeah. Well, in times of war that, that unfortunately that can be true. Um, but there are many, many other situations where um, it's not true at all. And of course, this interpreter in the novel, he's basically just he's attempting to facilitate the communication. It's not like when an invader let's say the US uh, in Afghanistan, and you have these translators who were, you know, they were widely viewed as, as traitors and their lives were in danger because of this. Uh, and, and, and that's just the most timely example I can think of. Mm -hmm. um, but in any situation like that, where um, a native is enabling an, an invader, through the translation process. Well, that's very different. Um, in this case, he was trying to mediate between two pillars, basically. The on was representative of Hassan ibn Norman. Um, and by, by if they su he should succeed in his task, he would be averting um, further war. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm just conscious of the time, and so I'm going to go ahead and uh, I, I just answered one question um, from the Q&A, and I see another written one, but I also see a hand up from 
Uh, Ayman, uh, are you able to, uh, if, if you're not able to unmute, maybe you can just, Ayman, if you wanna um, throw your hand, throw your question into the Q&A box. Um, Cause I don't think folks can speak. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong about that. Um, so let me go to the first question written in the Q&A and um, then from there, hopefully we'll get some more. So uh, D. Novak asks, are the Emazigh passages in the book translated into English and why or why not? Um, Nancy, do you want to explain how that's working? Yeah. Well, yes, yes, they are. Um, and, and you can see, um, so in the Arabic, you have the Amazigh transliterated, and then you have the Arabic translation of the meaning. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so Nancy gives us italicized uh, Amazigh. Yeah. Uh, can you see it? Is it, is it visible? Well, I'll just explain it like that, like Nancy brilliantly. Like in the Arabic, it's written, it's trans, the Mazis is written in transliterated Arabic, and then it's translated into Arabic. So Nancy just sort of reproduces that effect for us in, in, in the English translation. So she gives us italicized the Mazis language transliteration, and then the English, which is translating the Arabic and the I, I had to I had to interpolate certain things because since the original is just the transliterated energy followed by the Arabic translation. For example, I, I say, she says, which I, I don't know how to read it because it's in energy, but anyway, she says something like that. And then um, we have our own scripture, said the interpreter addressing himself in Arabic to the Muslim general's envoy. I had to, I had to add addressing himself in Arabic to the Muslim general. I see, yeah. I had to add that because you don't know that he was speaking Arabic. Um, right. So, so I had to, you know, go back over it and interpolate things that would make it clear that he is translating this thing that she said in that unknown language into Arabic, and if he's speaking Arabic, he's not speaking English. You know. Mm -hmm. Great. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a little dizzying, but I I get it, and hopefully our our attendees get it now as well. Um, are there other questions? I'm looking on the Facebook. Um, is okay. this the author to be nominated for the Booker Prize? Yeah, I've already answered this, uh, Sue. I think. Uh, okay. Yeah, I I wrote I just wrote in that you were you met you said the Booker, but it's the it's what's known as the Arabic Booker, which is the IPAF, the International Prize for Arabic Fiction. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. See where that confusion. It's not actually a booker, yeah, but has the same status in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had some other questions. Um, for instance, what what has been the most rewarding thing about undertaking and completing this translation so far? Yeah. Well. Um, in addition to the privilege of interacting with um, and so closely with such an amazing writer as Ibrahim um, Kony, I think the most rewarding thing was the fact that I had a chance to translate an author who was dealing with so many of the issues that I feel so passionately about. He, he clearly is passionate about, um, you know, the place of women, preserving native languages and cultures, uh, recognizing human limitations uh, as as we relate to our natural surroundings, um, all the types of things that I feel very passionate about were packed into this novel, and so that was extremely rewarding. I'd say that that was the most rewarding thing. Uh, 
Um, I'm seeing another uh, question from uh, Ken Senyuri. Hi, Ken. Uh, many thanks for this dialogue. Would you recommend this book to undergraduate students? If so, at what level? Yeah, not a 101 course. Uh, no. <laughs> probably, probably a 400, 300, 400 level. Uh, in part just because of the, it's just the language is kind of dense. I mean, even in English, it's kind of dense and, and it requires an appreciation of the, of the the history behind it. But yeah, I, I would, yeah, I would say like if you're teaching um, the, the, the Muslim conquests of North Africa, this would be a great, I, it's hard. Um, uh, and, you know, often we teach that history in, uh, in an intro level uh, type course, like intro to the Middle East, like here's where Islam comes from and here's the spread of it and all of that stuff. But um, to bring in even just a few chapters possibly, um, because it, it, it really gets into the details of what was this like from the from the perspective of conquered peoples, um, what was the religion, you know, like there was, it wasn't just, you know, like backwards paganism, he really articulates a system of belief that has resemblance to the monotheism that Muslims thought was so unique to, you know, like it's their mission to bring. Um, so I would recommend it any class dealing with, you know, we often teach the spread of Islam and the Islamic conquests as kind of a miracle, which in a way it was, I mean, the short amount of time and the sheer amount of territory. Um, but he, he gets you to the, what that was like from the perspective of the conquered. So either in that type of a class or any class looking at you know, subalterns perspective of the conquered indigenous um, practices and, and, and religions and beliefs that those are all sort of advanced um, courses, but that's my, that's my <laughs> teacher take on it. <laughs> we have another um, question in the Q&A, which I'll just read out from um, Yasmin Amin. Um, I get the feeling that Kony tries to reconstruct, not just to be critical and deconstruct, for example, the Kahena raising her enemy's child and making him her son. Yes. And also the military leader, I forget his name now, who renounces the glory and the girls who were taken away as slaves and so on. He offers solutions in a way to right the wrongs. So what do you think about that reading, Nancy? Yes, I agree. I mean, we've, there's so much in the novel that we haven't touched on. Um, and there are characters like Hanesh Sanani, um, he was a uh, he he was very very critical. He was under uh, not Uthman the Nath. He was under um, Zuhair bin Qais al Badawi, who um, he succeeded. He succeeded Uthman the Nath. Uthman the Nath was a general who had very much um, he had abused the Crusader, who apparently who had claimed to embrace Islam. And instead of honoring that, he treated them with great um, contempt. And um, this inspired the hatred even more of the, the native peoples, of course. And um, Hassan uh, Sanani, uh, Hanesh Sanani was under Zahir bin Qais al Badawi, and he, he broke away. He broke away and then went back to the East instead of continuing the fight. But there's another el element to him, too. That's, uh, it's a mystical element. He's he's a very much the mystic, and um, that's a that's a an element that we don't see uh, very much. But um, I agree. I mean, Coney introduces all sorts of uh, very thoughtful uh, angles into the story and into the characters. Uh, these were not necessarily um, central characters, but each one adds a little piece. And there's Zubair, um, Ibn Zubair, who had, he rebelled against Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, the, the caliph at the time. And he is very much hailed as a hero um, because he rejected the worldliness and materialism of the Umayyad uh, caliphate. And uh, it was, the Umayyad caliphate was particularly, I guess, notorious for this, this aspect of its rule. 
um, to the point where people would uh, convert to Islam. And then in spite of having converted, they would be, they would have the jizya imposed on them. They would find ways of proclaiming that they hadn't really converted or whatever, and then impose the jizya anyway, and even take away their daughters as uh, captives. There's the, another sub theme is this, this, this tragic father who, who had converted to Islam, um, and um, nevertheless, he's treated with absolute contempt and his daughters are taken away because he can't pay uh, the jizya, which he should have had to pay to begin with. And <clears throat> so that's a long answer, but uh, yes, I, I, I agree with this person's suggestion, yeah. Right, it's not just a critique, but, um, but uh, I mean, an archive really of practices mm -hmm. and, and systems and beliefs and attitudes that, first of all, Arabic literature has not really been interested in um, in chronicling, but also just that interest in the interior monologue and the poetry and the, um, it's almost like he's changing the novel into the Duen lot of like, it's not poetry anymore, it's just the novel and like this is where um, he puts all of these these beliefs. But this is why it's great, I think great for, te for teaching if you can, you got to give the students the explanatory framework, mm -hmm. like just give them all the situation that they need. Um, mm -hmm. And then it will reward you, I think, because, you know, students know about surrealism and they know about trippy, um, you know, <laughs> stuff yeah. like that. So yeah. um, here's another question from D. Novak. Um, how rare are these narratives about the Islamic conquests told from the native perspective? And do you think this novel will get much backlash or stir controversy or perhaps open a dialogue? I personally am not familiar with other things like this from the native perspective, at least in terms of the North African uh, region. There may be some others, um, but I, that was another thing that actually attracted me to it. I thought, this is amazing. This is so important um, because I think it's rare. Um, mm -hmm. There may be others, but if they, I don't, I'm not aware of them. And I think it's quite a rare phenomenon and I just to be commended. Definitely for this. Yeah, I'm, I have to think on it a little, but as far as like historical fictions, um, nothing is really, as, and of North Africa in particular, nothing is really coming to mind. Um, there are some Francophone texts that do this. Mm -hmm. Dries Shrebi has, a, has like a, a, a trilogy of novels that are really interested in Amazigh, um, culture and chronicling the arrival of Arabs and Islam to Morocco, but those are Francophone. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, and Kay, the lovely, wonderful Kay is, is telling us that Gamal al the, um the Egyptian novelist has told us that the novel had become the one Arab. So he's a famous novelist from the 60s generation. So that's not me, <laughs> it was, I'm just, inadvertently quoting uh, El Khitani's uh, <laughs> version. Um, so thank you, Kay, and thank you, Dee. Another question, um, how difficult was this translation compared to other translations that you have done, Nancy, for example, of Ibrahim Nasrullah? Yeah, it was very difficult, actually. Um, much more difficult. Uh, Ibrahim Nasrullah is just a different type of writer, you know. Ibrahim Masala doesn't focus on, um, he, he doesn't focus on eloquence as much as just telling the story. Ibrahim just tells the story. And whereas Ibrahim Masala uh, or Ibrahim Makhoni, um, he just, he revels in the language. <laughs> he, he just, you know, he, he's so passionate about the language and he's such a master um, that uh, he just can't help himself. <laughs> he just is so poetic and, and uh, he uh, goes to great lengths to uh, let you experience that. So, so it's beautiful, but it makes it a very difficult. 
it's not just about the story it's about like the landscape is the story the yes. the prophecy is the story yeah and the way you tell it i think for him is also just very important and and this is this is, is his style it's the nature of his style i don't think he he wouldn't be himself if he wrote in some other way so um i'm trying to think is also very difficult to translate in that sense um very because she would agree <laughs> yeah she's extremely self-conscious about her language uh ibrahim nasrallah is just conscious of the story um i mean he's he's just intent on telling you and, and he's very good at it you know and his character portrayal is beautiful and his character development and the relationships and all of the wonderful cultural um media that he introduces you to it's all wonderful but it's in very simple language so um for example um guys are weddings it's deceptively simple the language mm -hmm. is so simple and so straightforward and yet there are layers you just keep peeling away layers to try to figure out what he's really saying so it was easy to translate in some ways, but on another level, not so easy. Yeah. So, but in any case, yeah, going back to Islamist identity, oh my goodness, so many plays on words and so many um, very consciously poetic, uh, what's the word I want? Well, figures of speech and plays on words, I found it very hard. Yeah. And Arabic loves that stuff and English hates it. Like it, it just like you bring it into to English and it's like wah, wah. it just like we just we we really lost that like romance with the with the language that she plays with so much in Arabic that's not, not <laughs> the prose it. doesn't love it. <laughs> Maybe in an earlier era. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. One last question that I think would be great to end with um, for Nancy. Um, um, so what do you love about translating Arabic? <laughs> hmm. um, well, I think first you just have to love Arabic. And, uh, and there's a lot to love. So that's one thing. And then I've always loved my own language. So I, I think if you love the language that you have been in, immersing yourself in, and if you love your own language, uh, and if you, I grew up with words and my, my mother was a very language conscious person and um, language was very important in our family. Um, so I just, I love the process of just to see, you know, how you get this, to that, how how you turn, you know, how you convert this into that, and and the feeling of success, you know, the the, the joy of feeling that you conveyed it in your own language in a way that we hope approximates um, the Arabic. It's a it's an art form, I think. Um, I think of it, you know, I I left music by the wayside long ago, and I, I've sometimes bemoaned that and so forth. And I think, well, you know what? I've got I've got a, an art too. So um, I think, yeah, it feels like an art. And I love that part of it, yeah. Uh, another comment from um, just as a K, I feel as if it, I think meaning translation is an exercise in pure writing, bringing a set narrative to new words. And I, I can add to that too, um, you know, there are many, theorists of translation who have called translation um, the closest and most intimate form of reading, because it's as you were describing earlier, you really have to just make a messy rendering of that sentence mm -hmm. in order to get it, in order to English it, you know, but you needed, you needed that messy, mm -hmm. complete sentence to get into it before you rewrite it really, which is what translation also is, is it's grasping that original and then recreating it in a way that 
yeah, it's not literally reproducing the meanings of the words, but it is creatively and aesthetically reproducing the effect of the language on the new readership. And that's what's so hard. And also when you feel like you're there, you feel like a magician, really, like a conjurer. <laughs> Yeah, and, and if, if someone says, you know, uh, you know, I felt like, let's say it's a bilingual person and they say, I felt in the English what I felt when I read in the English. Oh my gosh, you know, that is the best. That is just the best thing you could tell me, you know, because that's what we're after. That's what we want. So I think we should turn it back over to um, Suzanne uh, to wrap things up. Yeah, I personally enjoyed this so much and I'm sure other attendees shared the same sentiment that I have. This has been completely enlightening to us. Um, so I just, I really want to thank you on behalf of AC Press and Hope of Fiction, both Nancy and Emily for taking the time of your day uh, to share your experiences and this wonderful discussion. We are truly grateful. And I also want to thank everyone who joined us uh, in this discussion of the night will have its say. Um, as I said, it's available uh, worldwide. I've tried to post some links in the chat so you can order it, but also the book is available uh, in e-format. So as Kindle or ebook, uh, in case it's not available in your markets for any reason. Uh, but again, thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, we're, we're, we're honored to, to have you with us. And thank you so much, Emily, for the wonderful discussion. Yeah. And thank you, Nancy, for your incredible work oh. and unique. And this is a real contribution for teachers, for interested folks, for historians, for people working on the Maghreb. Absolutely, my pleasure, thank you. And the recording of uh, the discussion is going to be available right after uh, on our Facebook uh, page, AUC Press and Hope of Fiction, and um, in a day or two on our YouTube channel. Okay, so if anyone wants to go back to it, thank you so much. And, thank you, everyone. Uh, see you there, everyone. Merci, Aoi, Aoi. <laughs> Shukran. Bye.